Hi folks, Wonia Tebow here from Buckskin Revolution and Season 6 of Alone. And I am visiting the off-grid homestead community that I lived in for over a decade in Northern Oregon. And I'm hanging out in the area that used to be my hide tanning and brain tanning area. And now my friend Adam Stolte, who lives in the house that I built here, is using it as his bark tanning area. So I have this great opportunity to show you bark tanning and all of the stages that it takes to turn hides into bark tan, which is a wonderful, wonderful material to have and to pair with buckskin, which is what I'm wearing and what I mostly do. So brain tan buckskin is a new world style of tanning that's making a very lightweight, breathable, flexible, really comfortable, really durable leather for clothing. Bark tanning is a European tradition that is a thicker, tighter tanning technique that leaves the grain on the hide, which is that shiny leather, that, the shiny layer that we see on most commercial leather. And bark tan is wonderful for things like shoes and straps and bags and clothing that you want to have some water resistance to. So opposite sides of the spectrum, buckskin absorbs water like a sponge, but moves with your body, lightweight, breathable, flexible, Bark tan resists water, thicker, tougher, less stretchy, really wonderful for all of the things that buckskin isn't good for. And there's a really wide, wide range of things that bark tan has been used for all over the world. I, I know it as a largely European tradition, but it's been done a lot of other places too. And back in the day, before we had things like plastic and you know other molded modern materials, leather was used for so many things. So wine skins and boiled tankards and armor, boiled and steamed leather shaped into shields and I mean most material goods that you can think of, there's probably some tradition making it out of skins. So I wanted to walk you through some of the processes of bark tanning to show you another amazing technique that you can use to make goods that you need for your daily life out of the things right around you using all natural materials and traditional methods. So let's dive in and take a look and see how you go from turning something like this, a raw deer hide, into something beautiful and infinitely useful like this, a beautiful bark tanned hide. So the ideal scraping beam I find is a waist beam. You want it to be just about your waist, but somewhere between your waist and your pelvis tall and usually a nice long one so that I have a pretty shallow angle. I don't want a super steep angle because that's hard on my back. Um, and a nice smooth surface. So a log is wonderful, but if it's left out in the weather, then it can crack. And anywhere you have a crack in your log is an area where you're not getting a very good scrape. So PVC can be a really nice cheat because it can be left out in the weather without cracking or changing. And of course, it's a very smooth, even round surface. So the first stage of the process is fleshing. And if the animal was skinned really well, sometimes you don't even need to do this stage. So the way an animal ideally would be skinned would be a cut around the neck, around just behind the animal's ears and down around the chin, and then down the midline of the animal, and then out each limb, and then around the bottom of each leg. And then sometimes you need to use your knife just a little bit to free up the hide around the brisket, like the sternum of the animal, and give you something to hold on to. And from that point, you should set your knife down and just use your hands, get in there with your, with your thumb or with your fist, and push the hide off of the animal. Using your knife is going to result in two things. One, cutting into your meat so that it doesn't keep as well and you're losing some meat, and two, potentially and very likely slashing into your hide. So no good. Really much better to fist off the hide or hand pull it or use a winch or whatever you need to do to not use your knife to cut the hide off, which is really hard because a lot of hunters have these big, beautiful skinning knives that they want to use and that they think are important for that. But you're so much better off using a little small knife and not cutting the hide off. So this hide obviously is already off of the animal and I've actually already fleshed it and I didn't think to film that part of the process. So I'm going to pretend like it hasn't been fleshed. And one thing is that there's a little muscle that we call the twitch muscle. It's the muscle that makes the skin of the 
deer or the horse or the cow twitch when a biting fly lands on it. It's a muscle that we don't have. Our skin doesn't do that. But most ungulates, most hooved animals have that twitch muscle. That can be hard to get off of the skin. So I like to skin an animal from the neck down. And then when I reach around just behind the shoulder blades, that's where that muscle starts. And if you're skinning neck down, you can usually get your hands behind that muscle and leave it on the carcass rather than on the hide. If you skin from by hanging the animal with the bottom legs up and skin from the, the butt towards the neck, it's way harder to leave that muscle on the carcass. So that's one, one thing you can do to make your fleshing way easier. But even if you have just that muscle, that's still pretty good. What you don't want is big chunks of fat and meat on there. So this hide, unfortunately, was skinned kind of poorly and someone used their knife too much and we have a bunch of slash marks, we call them score marks, where the person cut pretty deeply into the hide, not all the way through to make an actual hole, but a deep slash that might end up being a hole as we put it through the whole tanning process, which is a bummer. But this is demonstrating as if there was still flesh and fat on the hide. So I would take my tool, which is a very dull, flat tool. I don't want it to be so sharp it can slice the hide, just sharp enough to kind of grip the flesh or the grain and hair, in the case of brain tanning, and push it off. And there is a little bit of membrane on this hide, so I am taking off a little something. So I'm going to be going over the entire surface of the hide, taking off any flesh, fat, or membrane that's still on there getting the hide ready for the next stage, which is going to be soaking, and in the case of bark tanning, bucking, which is soaking the hide in an alkaline solution. So I'm at the bucking stage, so I want to be soaking my hide in an alkaline solution. And there are a lot of different alkaline solutions that you can use, but my favorite is hydrated lime. So this is, uh, you can buy it at hardware stores. It's called Type S Building Lime, and it's something that folks used to use for making plasters before concrete was invented. So there's a lot of ancient traditions of using this. It's what whitewash is made of, and a lot of the um, really typical like Swiss chalet with the white walls and the big cross beams, uh, those were whitewashed using lime. A lot of traditional English cob houses are whitewashed, so a long tradition of it. And my favorite way to make lime is by burning oyster shells. So you burn them really hot, you drive off all of the oxygen and the carbon dioxide, and you make uh, calcium oxide. And then when you add water to that, you're making calcium hydroxide, which is very reactive and very alkaline. Other options are potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, or wood ash, all of which can be very caustic and potentially burn you or burn the hide whereas lime precipitates out of the solution once it gets to too high in alkalinity. So you can't damage your hide easily with it unless your hide gets too warm, which kind of ups the, the destructive nature. Um, that's not the word I want to use. Uh, unless your hide gets too warm, which will kind of up the, the potency of the alkalinity and can damage your hide. So this is what the lime looks like. It's going to be a white kind of crumbly solid, and then when we add water to it, it's going to make a nice white opaque solution. So I'm going to add water. I'm wearing gloves because while it's not strong enough to really burn my skin, it can be very drying and it can irritate your skin if it's in contact for a long time. So you don't have to, but you'll find that you're probably going to want to wear gloves when working with hydrated lime. And then the hide goes into the bucket. It's ideal to use something larger than a five gallon bucket because ideally you don't want the hide really squished and folded onto itself because anywhere where there's a fold in the hide might be a place that that alkaline solution won't get to and then that spot could rot. So 
definitely ideal to use like a big tub, 55 gallon drum or wash barrel, but don't use metal. Metal is reactive. So something plastic or if you are so lucky to have a big wooden cask, amazing, use that. And then I'm gonna let it sit until the hair is what we call slipping, which means it's falling out of the follicle and the grain is still intact. So I want it to come out of the follicle pretty easily so that I'm not damaging the grain to get that hair off. So this is a hide that's been soaking in a lime solution for about three days. So I'm throwing it over the beam and I'm gonna test it to see if the hair is slipping well enough to be ready for prepping for bark tan. And yeah, so this one's looking pretty good, but I think it could use another day or so to soak. So then I'll carry on and I'll push all of the hair off of it and then I'll rinse it off and then I will put it into my bark liquor. And I'll talk you through making bark liquor. So yes, you guessed right. One of the key ingredients for bark tanning is in fact bark. So the reason why we use the word tanning to imply processing a skin and preserving it so that it stays flexible without rotting is actually from tannins, which are a chemical found in barks and some other vegetable matter. So some plants actually have so much tannin in their wood that you can use the wood and not just the bark to tan. That's uh, one, one really good example is a South American plant called cabracho, which is actually what is used for almost every modern tannery that I, that I know of. Um, most of that is not done in this country anymore, unfortunately. But at one time in this country, the tanning industry was really reliant on oaks, particularly a particular oak that grows in California called tan oak. I wonder why it was used for tanning. Um, so that has the strongest concentration of tannins of any of the oaks or any plant that I'm familiar with in this country. But a lot of different barks have tannins and a good example is Douglas fir. Mm -hmm. So usually a dark color is going to indicate tannins, particularly a color that's going to turn darker once it's exposed to air. So it's the inner bark and not the outer bark of trees that generally has the most tannins. Some other plants that you can use are a plant called Cañagre, which is also known as Tanner's Dock, and that's the root of a plant in the Rumex genus related to like Curly Dock and Yellow Dock, which I believe are the same thing, common names for um, one plant. But um, also Sumac, so some of the hides that I showed earlier are actually done with Sumac. Um, acorns, acorn caps, a lot of nut hulls. So there are a lot of things with tannins in them and tannins are very astringent. So sometimes you can tell by licking something and if it makes your mouth go like this and makes your tongue kind of suck up where you licked it, good chance it has tannins in it. So to get the tannins out, we are going to chop this into small pieces so that we can water extract the tannins into what we call a bark liquor, which is essentially just a strong tea of bark. And it's easier to chop the bark before it's dried. You're just trying to maximize the surface area of your bark. So I would go ahead and cut up all of these slabs of bark into smaller pieces and then start cooking them down into a bark liquor. And there are a lot of different ways to make a bark liquor. You can do a cold extraction or a hot extraction, or you can actually put your hides into a mixture of the bark and water, and then your bark is going to slowly extract and make a stronger and stronger solution as your hide sits there soaking in it. Um, so there are a lot of different techniques, but I'm gonna, let's, let's walk you through a couple of them. So here's one fabulous contraption. This is, I believe it's brewing equipment, but this is a metal barrel with a nozzle at the bottom and a propane burner underneath. So this is lovely chunks of nice bark that's been broken up like I showed you in water. And then you can cook it down and then take your bark liquor out the bottom. So let's show you that. All right, check it out. Beautiful little spout o bark liquor. And you can see this is a beautiful, rich red. It's a little frothy here, but 
a beautiful rich red color. So you can see the rich red color of this bark liquor. I'm just gonna pour it back in and we'll do another boil and extraction to make it even stronger. So let's take a look at some hides that have been in the bark liquor for a little while. And you can see this bark liquor is a lot paler because the hides in the solution have absorbed most of the tannins. So this hide is still pretty pale. It's not tanned through. You can see it gets kind of a, a tie-dyed effect from being folded here and there. So what we're after is a nice, dark, uniform tan showing the tannins have accessed all areas of the hide. But generally it takes several additions of stronger bark liquor as the hide is slurping those tannins up out of the solution. Here is a hair on hide and this is a small goat and this skin is a little bit more uniformly tanned. So here is another technique, and this is a hide that's soaking in a solution with the bark in the solution as well. So as the hide is slurping up those tannins out of the solution, more are being drawn out of the bark. So here is this hide. It's a little bit thicker, so it's going to take a lot more solution for this, but this one is a little bit more uniform. It's been in the bark for longer, so it's a little bit more thoroughly tanned. And then as always with hides that you're processing in any way, whether it be bucking or putting them in a brain solution or putting them, putting them in a bark liquor like this, you're going to want to be moving them constantly to make sure that all of the areas of the hide are getting access to the tannins, that there aren't any folds that are going to keep that area from being tanned and also allow it to rot. After the hide's been soaking in your bark liquor for a while, you're going to want to take it out and do a process called scudding. So scudding is a process of going over the membrane side, the flesh side of the hide, and you're both squeegeeing out the bark liquor so that it's going to suck more in, and you're also removing the membrane. The membrane takes a while to get off of the hide. As it gets tanned more and more, it's a little bit easier to get more of the membrane off. So it's going to be a long process of taking off the membrane bit by bit as it's tanning in the solution. So scudding looks like fleshing and like dehairing in that you're throwing it over your beam and you're going over it with your dull scraper. Some people call scudding whitening because you're taking off the tanned membrane that has color to it and revealing the dermis beneath that has not yet been thoroughly tanned. You want to go ahead and scud your hide every couple days that it's in the solution, ideally. It will really hasten the process, it'll make it go faster, or you could leave it longer and not scud as often or as many times, and then it's just gonna take longer and you're gonna have more membrane on your hide. All right, back in the bark. And some nice dark bark liquor, so very little color and a lot more color. Once the hide has been thoroughly tanned in the bark, it's going to be a lot darker and really uniform in color. And every different type of tannin is going to have a slightly different color. This one looks like it was dyed with black walnut in addition to being tanned with other substances. So this is a really dark hide. So after the hide is thoroughly tanned, which you can tell by cutting off a little piece and seeing if the color has made it all the way through the hide, if there's a white line in the middle of the hide, then that means that the tannins haven't fully penetrated. So once you get to that point, you're going to pull the hide out and you're going to let it dry a little bit and then you're going to grease it. So the grain is going to be crackly and your hide isn't going to come flexible and soft unless you oil it and work it as it's going from wet to dry. So this is a hide that has been oiled and is ready for working. 
Here is an example of some hide that I was bark tanning that I let go without tending to and the the hide was thoroughly tanned but the solution dried out without me realizing it and it got stiff and hard. So to work this leather it's going to need to be damped back so soaked until it's pliable again and then let dry enough that it can absorb some oil and then I'll thoroughly oil it and there's a lot of different ways that you can oil a hide and it all is going to depend on the qualities that you want in the finished hide so if you want a thicker stiffer sole leather or something then a heavier weight uh, like a tallow mixed with some lard and then for medium something the consistency of lard and then for a really loose stretchy floppy pliable flexible hide a much lighter weight oil like a neat's foot oil or what you would use to brain tan a hide a brain solution or an egg yolk and water solution or a fish oil or some very lightweight oil so you have a lot of flexibility in creating a lot of different products with your bark tanning so that is an example of hide not well worked and here is a wonderful example of a beautifully softened bark tanned hide so this is a hide that was tanned with sumac and turned out gorgeous here is a similar hide done in the same solution only this had the grain removed to make something more like a buckskin but less flexible and stretchy than buckskin so again, depending on how you process your hides and how you treat them after the tanning, you can have a wide variation of different types of leather, all with natural materials and nothing gnarly involved. Which is to say that chemically tanned leather, chrome tan leather, is a really gnarly process involving a lot of nasty chemicals, heavy metals, very polluting. So I'm an advocate of naturally tanned leather, not just because it's far, far superior, but also because it's so much easier on you and the environment and the leather itself. So naturally tanned leather, so many ways to go about it, and it is some of the best stuff on earth. So thanks for your interest in learning about naturally tanned leather, bark tan, and look for more videos about brain tan and other techniques on my YouTube channel. Thanks guys.